coach. Still so, waiting yeah. about still that. Still trending so right. If you're with me in the center, we're fine. But I I'm a like storm it. chaser, so if all my friends that I make in the summer that I never get to see, they just flew to Orlando yesterday, and I'm like, I'm not there! I'm at Dragon Con! And now it's turning away, and I'm like, hey, hey. <laughs> Hi, guys, I'm Alethea Causes. I just realized yesterday that I was the moderator for this panel. <laughs> so these are all the notes I made five minutes before this panel. Uh, and introductions of myself, because I do a lot of things, so I wrote down some bit. Oh, Storm Chasing, I mentioned that. Uh, New York Times bestseller of YA Fantasy, but I also do freelance reviewing for NPR. I narrate for Escape Artists. I've done IGMS, <laughs> Clark's World, Shimmer, Apex, and ACS, and I was an Audi Awards judge for eight years. Ooh, ooh. If you don't know what the Audi Awards are, you should look them up, because if anyone says, oh, I'm looking for a good audiobook, I point them there. If they are on the Audi Awards finalist, list they are an amazing audiobook all of the finalists are hard and i was a finalist judge so it is hard to pick among those last five because they were always the cream of the crop um so and i'm your lovely moderator and i'm going to pass it on to jd led first i'm keeping this one good you do this hi i am jd ledford i am an indie audiobook narrator uh, I voice the Starship Grifters books, uh, the Iron Dragon trilogy, which was up for a Dragon Award last year, the, the book, not the audio book. Um, and that's basically what I do. Hi, I'm Robert Ross, and I write the Sentinel's Creation series and the Paradigm 2045 series. And they are available in print and audiobook, so I'm not a narrator, I'm just an author. And as the gods must be liking me today, so my book just got a, an audiobook a review award. Stuart Jaffe. I'm the author of over 40 books now. Um, I write a lot of series. So I'm, I'm best known for the Max Porter Paranormal Mystery series and the uh, Nathan K action fantasy series um, and a whole bunch of other stuff. I narrate a lot of my own audiobooks. I also have narrated for, uh, for many years, I narrated for IGMS. Um, and uh, but I've also worked with uh, indie narrators, and um, I've worked through uh, publishers as well. So I got lots to say. Oh, and I I, I did the uh, I was the co-host and producer of the Eclectic Review podcast, which years ago ran for about six years and four hundred episodes. So. But other than that, other than that, <laughs> I sleep on occasion. <laughs> hey guys, I'm. Uh, I'm Dakota Krebs. Um I am a author and the owner of Mountain Dale Press. Um, so I do my own books. I also do the books of fellow authors in my genre, typically. Um, I uh, work with narrators on a regular basis. I, I choose uh, narrators for my own series. I uh, help my authors choose narrators, and then I work to get them um, hired and get them uh, contracts and get them working with us. Uh, my books were the uh, Audible uh, 2017 um, Top 5 Fantasy. Um, I had the Listener's Choice September uh, two, 2018, um, also on Audible. Um, and uh, we sold, my, I'm looking at my wife in the back to make sure that she's agreeing with the information. <laughs> um, and, uh, she, you can bake it up, nobody would know. Yeah. <laughs> and we sold, um, well, I'm gonna say that, we have uh, about 50,000 uh, reviews on our audiobooks right now, just my personally, um, and then our authors are doing very well themselves. So. I am uh, James Palmer, I write uh, science fiction and uh, folk adventure, um, I have a space opera, uh, a couple of space opera novels called Star Swarm, I also publish uh, for Fall Staff Books a line of novellas, um, the uh, First one's called The Depths of Time. It's about uh, Captain uh, Richard Francis Burton teaming up with Captain Nemo and the time traveler to fight Nathulu. <laughs> I've also written a script for the Atlanta Radio Theater Company. It's an adaptation of the late Jerry Fornell's novel, Exiles to Glory. Um, if you've never listened to them, speaking of audio, they have a table upstairs. Go check them out, they're amazing. <laughs> So the thing about this panel is, I thought there was going to be all just narrators. Because then the focus of this panel is how to narrate an audiobook. And then I realized there were writers also on this panel. So we could take this panel in so many different directions. 
please ask some questions because I came up with some, but they're for one panel or another panel, and I'm not sure which panel you guys are here to watch. <laughs> so, does anyone have any questions? Okay, yes, thank you. Is it not standard practice in the industry to provide the reader a pronunciation guide? Uh, <laughs> certain readers have an interesting idea of how oh. words are. You mean like narrators of audio Yeah, it's like not pronunciation <laughs> part, but um, <laughs> has an interesting idea of how words are pronounced. Uh, and then there's going to be a couple of books that all of a sudden they'll switch the pronunciation of a certain word, especially if it's a universe word that the author invented, or in the case of James Morrison. Ruin, ruins of uh, not quality, <laughs> uh, but you will. But for like 15 years, I don't know. Um, is it not standard practice to provide like pronunciation? So, what we like to do um, at Mount Fresh is because no one else has jumped in. Um, oh, I'll jump in. I was just being nice. <laughs> we're all for you. Ah, well, so, what we do is we do ask for uh, pronunciation guides from our authors, um, especially if they're like uh, we have some authors that uh, we have one from Holland, uh, so he has a different take on how words might sound. Um, and typically, what they're going to say is um, either they're going to give us something or they're going to say just let it be up to artistic license. So we try to keep a narrator with the series the whole way through, and then if, if for some reason that doesn't work out, or if we need to switch to someone else, um, we will um, look for those hard words or things that are strange or off, and try to get it to match. Um, I don't know if that's standard practice across the board, but I don't know why it should be. Well, here's, here's the key thing: is you, have, you have to realize that audiobooks are this whole world is very new. It's been around for a long time in, in a small sector, but it's been exploding uh, uh, because of the ease of being able to download them now and, and just listen to them while you're jogging or whatever you want to do. So there are no standards. They're just what people are doing, and standards are slowly coming. So as a press, he's doing that. As an independent narrator, when I was working with IGMS, I would just email the author and say, here are the words that I'm not sure how you want, you know, give me a phonetic. But I've had my own stories narrated and the person just goes and does it. And I'm kind of, and then, then they ask me afterwards, is that okay? I'm like, no, so now you have to go do it again. <laughs> I mean, you should have asked first. So I, some stand, things are slowly becoming standardized, but there's no like official thing yet. So what I do with my uh, voice actor is the, uh, I provide pronunciations for the characters. So we have to work through each of the character voices. So at the same time we work through each of the character voices, we get through the pronunciation of their names. Um, I have a lot of um, different uh, dial dialogue that is in foreign language that slips back and forth because some of the characters when they get particularly pissed off slip into their native tongue. Um, and I do not provide any pronunciations for that, which really annoys me. But we've been working together for six years, so I said, well, I wrote it. It's your job to, to say it. <laughs> so so we, we tend to joke about that. But I suppose if you're in a new relationship with a, uh, with a voice actor, it certainly would be really helpful uh, to provide that, especially if you're going to be using some uh, other languages. Like I have the original uh, name for Scotch in 13th century Scotland, and I could spell it, I had no idea how to pronounce it, and you figured it out. I think it's pronounced spicy water. <laughs> Fire walks with you. Well, I think some of what you might have experienced, and I'm, I'm fairly new, I'm the baby on this panel, but I know with, I believe with the bigger publishing, there's more of a separation between the author and the narrator, where with indie narration, I've, you know, I've become buddies with my authors, so I'm harassing them, how do you want me to say this, and one of them even writes languages out of nothing but C's, K's, Y's, and Z's, just to jack with me, um, and he'll do more like you do, just go ahead and wing it, but then it's my job to be consistent with what I say with that. So I think, especially as an author, if you want that kind of control, you know, I mean, I think all narrators should be fanatical about pronunciation, but if you want that kind of control, the indie route where you're tight with your narrator is gonna help with that. So my, my first novel was Enchanted. It was done in an audiobook. Katie Kellgren did it, who is the most massively experienced, wonderful, the world misses her. She passed away a couple years ago. And she's so professional that we had an hour-long conversation that I was not expecting 
about pronunciation and everything. And that conversation taught me, when I started to do narration, how to approach my authors. So it, a lot of it is experience. Now when you're talking about James Marsden and Julia Roberts and everybody else, their time is money. So chances are they're in that booth for so long. If you have ever heard Julia Roberts read The Nanny Diaries, it's, I think it's Julia that did that. And she pronounced some very normal words very strangely. <laughs> but she's only got so much time to be in the booth. And I don't know if the editor said, did you mean to say what you just said? Or if they're just like, look, just go with it. Because we have her for five minutes, and that's all we have. So I think when you get to a certain level, level of celebrity, that's a different kind of narrator. But when you're in the Catherine Kelgren and that sort of Audi Award nominated folks who win things, they deep delve deep. I mean, Katie sung songs for me, she said. You have a song in here, did you have a tune in mind? And I actually didn't. So she made up the song for me, which I was not expecting. But I've given her spoilers, I, you know, all sorts of things that inform how she's going to perform that voice. And that was so, she really taught me a lot about how to communicate, and I think communication with the, um, with the author of the story is really important for a narrator, narrator, and really important for an author to actually reach out and do that too. Uh, yes, go ahead. How did you get started in uh, narration? Me? Or, no, everybody else, Stuart, how did you get started? Are you, are you asking like just how I personally got it, or how does one get started? How you personally throw all the Oh, I personally got started. Well, so I had done podcasting for a long time, and my undergraduate degree was in uh, directing theater. In which case, I had to learn how to do everything I've been, you know, as an actor and all that. So uh, I actually had all these skills separately that go into doing it, and. Um, I had my I had my books and I kind of wanted to do them and I started looking into it and and I'm sure we'll get into this later but it's expensive to have somebody else do it and then you end up having to either pay them out directly or split a royalty with them and I was just like but I have all the equipment if I just put in the time now I'm just getting money with anybody <laughs> so I tried it and I I like doing it and so I stick with it. Well, the, the short answer that I like to give because it amuses me and it's true, uh, I was flirting with an author on Twitter. <laughs> but uh, I did, I grew up acting from the time I was five at a competitive speech and debate through high school, but then I pursued biochemistry and then I started having a lot of children. Um, so I've, I've been a stay-at-home mom for over 20 years and I was horsing around on Twitter and uh, sent him one of my commercials just so he'd know what my voice sounded like because I have done a little bit of freelance commercial work. You, you want to do an audio book? Okay. And uh, the book I tumbled into, the first book in the series was done by the inimitable Kate Rudd and he couldn't afford Kate Rudd for the mm. second <laughs> So that was how I started. And uh, which those are very hard shoes to follow, but it's been a ton of fun. Yeah. So, so um, I'm not I'm not a narrator, but uh, I can tell you that uh, for me, I had an interesting experience getting into making audiobooks. Um, so, uh, if anyone here has like seen or read my books, if you're in a book label, okay. So, if, which of you started with audiobook? Yeah, see, I, I had no idea that that would be a thing. So three years ago, when my books were coming out, I had no idea that audiobooks were popular at all. So someone reached out and said, hey, why aren't you making audiobooks? And I said, because there's a, it's something that I am not interested in personally. So they said, well, how about you work with this guy over here and we'll put up that audiobook and you know, they'll work with you, they'll give you a good deal. And nine audiobooks later, you know, people are coming into a series um, and, and uh, authors are making somewhere between 30 to 50 percent of their uh, income on audiobooks, so it is a huge and growing market. So about, about 70 percent of my books revenue comes from the audiobooks. <clears throat> so um, almost, you know, it's only about 5 percent of print books, so that's, you know, it's depressing in some ways, right? So, People don't seem to, to, to want to hold the books as much. It's really hard to sign audiobooks. It's <laughs> harder and more annoying to people to sign their ebook. Um, but to answer your specific question, I forgot who asked the question about uh, how you start about. Um, I, I can answer not from a from a writer standpoint, but my uh, my daughter is moving into voice acting, so she's 
just starting that, that process. So she's putting together a, a demo tape um, on to ACS uh, and going to be doing starting off as uh, doing it as a, as a royalty share. Uh, but I think the most important thing is that she's got a mentor. So she is mentoring with my narrator, I mean, uh, Nick Bodell. Anyone you know, listen to any of his? <laughs> so, so, so he's my he's my voice actor, and so she, he's he and I have been friends over the years. We've been collaborating, so he's he's doing that with her, giving her some, some tips. My super short answer is: I bought a blue snowball mic, and I sat in front of my laptop, and I started reading fairy tales. Because you just got to start somewhere, and from then you spend so much money. It's really crazy. Um, okay, anybody else? You had a question. Yes. Yeah. So how much how much importance do you put on things like character, voice, and tone? You know, especially if you're dealing with you know a different gender, a different accent, a different. You know, nationality. You mentioned language uh, was important, uh, but how much do you do you put uh, emphasis on that versus something like a radio play? Jump in, dude! Right. Jump in! All right. So um, there's, you can hit on several different things, and it depends on the kind of audiobook you're doing. So just for me narrating my own books, I certainly want to put on a slightly different different tone, of maybe a higher pitch for a woman and a little just so that the reader, the listener, knows this, this is who's talking. You, you you have to have a little bit. Um, and then there, and in certain cases I might have a character who has a very distinctive voice and, and I'll, I'll play with that. But there are other there are other there are audiobooks that have actual multiple actors and so you'll have a female playing a female and they're playing a male and that too. Um, just, you know, the, the, you know, if you're going to be a narrator, one of the key things, though, is, and I'm terrible about this, but you should take notes as to what voice you're doing, especially in a long series where you suddenly do a callback to a character from like four books ago, and suddenly I find myself having to dig up my old audio files to go, how did I do, what was the voice I did for that? So I think and this is to be a, from a position of ignorance, because as a writer, I'm not a narrator. So I think of it, that there's a difference between narration and voice acting. So that's just from my perspective as an author. So for my books, I, I wanted a voice acting. So I needed someone that could switch seamlessly, because my, my books are exceptionally dialogue heavy. If you've ever watched the show, because I'm really dating myself, Moonlighting from years ago. Oh, yeah. Well, that's one of the thickest scripts at the time. Lots of lots of banter dialogue. So I needed somebody that could switch between a 24-year-old Scottish girl and a 70-year-old angelic being speaking in a high British accent and be able to do that and then put three other people in the room so that you could at any point in time as the, as the listener know who was saying what to whom. Um, and that, I think, is not narration. I think that's literally voice acting. I did the fairy tale rant vlog, like the YouTube channel. I think I started doing my fairy tale rants uh, after that because the fairy tales. I was reminding myself about the fairy tales. Then I started doing the fairy tale rants. Um, so I'm trying. To, I don't even. Well, I should have done more research. <laughs> um, what was my next step? I think I ended up getting a better microphone, but also, oh, someone from NPR that I met actually said. Sometimes I've even thrown a blanket over my head because in the room you get so much room noise. That's your first problem. Um, so then I was I was recording things with my mic with a blanket over my head. That's very warm. <laughs> um, I went to an audio words and one of the publishers there that ended up growing into a very large audio publisher said that they started out in a closet. A walk-in closet full of clothes is a nice natural buffer. There are still many today who do that. My studio is in my walk-in closet. Um, so you, look, you start to look for those natural things. Actually, ACX has some really great series, video series on how to get started and how to sort of soundproof an area um, and what, you know, initial opening level. Blue snowball mics are really still very, very good. All the blue mics are really good. Um, did I answer your question? 
Then you have to learn how to edit it. That's a whole nother learning curve. Then that takes a long time. It takes longer, much longer to edit, unless you can pay someone to edit it for you, and then that takes money. And maybe you guys can talk about the editing Are you asking like what's the next step to actually have a career doing? Yes. So, I mean, there's, again, this is all new world, so there's no one thing to do, but a very common thing is to uh, get your feet wet on ACX. Yes. Which, uh, you know what we're talking about in ACX? ACX is uh, uh, a, the, what does it stand for? The Audio, audio, audio Creators Exchange. It's basically authors who are looking to have their books made into audio books and narrators who are looking for books to narrate get together, uh, and, you, know, you, you, you connect through ACX and you can either, uh, I as an author can just pay you outright uh, and it would be it's based on uh, what's called a, a uh, finish the hour. Per finish hour. Per finish hour. So if you, finish, if you do the whole book and it, it's six hours, then I'd be paying whatever, $100 an hour, even if it took you 12 to make those six hours. Yeah. Um, or you can do a royalty split, split, so I pay you nothing, but then you get half of whatever I make. For seven years, um, but that's a good way to get your feet wet. And then I've seen a lot of people who start that way, and then as they get a bit bigger and you know more known, then they then they start charging rates that that the indie and smaller authors can't afford, and they go from there. You know, off of the exchange. Yeah, I've seen it from around seventy dollars to a thousand dollars an hour on on ACX. One cautionary tale for anyone who's looking to do that and is entertaining uh, manuscripts in the lit RPG genre. Anybody playing with that genre? Okay. So, so. Okay. So you'll you'll be able to talk about this even more. Mm -hmm. But but um, uh, some of my my friends that are in in the narration and. Uh, I was like, why, why why are you not making money on this? And I was like, well, there's lots of sound effects. And sound effects take a tenth of a second to do, but it takes me 20 minutes to do it, or 30 minutes to get all this right, and then I take all the So, so from, from a, the, the voice acting standpoint, if you're doing that work, those sound effects are really time consuming. And I'll, I'll, I'll pause there to let you jump into that. Oh, all right. So, 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 so I, I guess the point is, is that um, if it, if it takes a lot longer to do something, uh, and you're only getting paid by the finish, and and you know if it takes you like 20 minutes to get that bell to sound right for your author because they just went up a level, um, then it's good, better to, to either separate out the sound effects and go, look, I'll record the audio for you. I'll be all the act, I'll be all the characters. But either you can have someone else put in the sound effects, or the sound effects are going to be priced at something other than per, per the finished hour. Generally speaking, for for just regular pros without any fancy stuff going on, you should expect it to take you for every finished hour. It's going to take you two hours to do. You know, an hour to record, and another full hour to edit it down. And that's once you know what you're doing. So when you're first getting started. It's going to take you a long time to figure out how to get it to sound ready. Um, and you just got to. And it's what about eight or nine thousand words an hour? Mm -hmm. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. I had no clue. Yeah. 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 It's a very exhausting yeah. process. You're not going to sit down and read a novel every day and be finished. It looks like something Do you guys uh, prep as well? Cause, cause it, well, I wrote the book, so I already know. <laughs> so for, um, for from, from my uh, voice actor, he reads through the entire book first, just by doing the prep process, and makes some sort of notes or does something magical, and then and then records, then edits, then masters. So when I when I've done when I used to do uh, audio for IGMS, I would do that, but those were short stories, so that was fine. I. I would be, that's very nice that he does that for you. I don't think most have the time to do that because time literally is money in this business. Um, and it's kind of like cover art artists. If you can get a cover artist who will read the whole book and to do the cover art, that's golden. And in some cases, if you're like working with Bain, I mean, that's part of why they pay their artists more than I pay my artists. But my artists, I just give them, this is kind of what I need, and they go on with that. 
Did you done audio for audio? Yeah. 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 And I did pretty much the same as you either. Sometimes I did a cold reading in the booth just to see how I felt, and sometimes I ended up with a southern accent. I didn't know how, but that was just what the, the manuscript was telling me. And I would email them back and say, so I did a southern accent. I hope that's okay. Let me know. But... And the other thing to realize is that if you get if you get hired, they're hiring you for your voice. So Ed, who was our editor at IGMS, he wouldn't send both of us. Listen, he would look at a story and be like, "This is a Stuart Jackson story. I need that lower register. I need that kind." Of, or he would send, "I need a fairy tale princess voice." So there we go. <laughs> the, southern, the southern accent was actually a serial killer. That was a fun one. <laughs> <laughs> For the Get Me Started, I uh, wanted to give a quick shout out. There's a great group on Facebook, the Indie ACX group. Tons of help there for newbies. Um, you want to be very careful when you start auditioning. You, you do need a good mic. You need to know something about editing software when you get started. Don't do what I do. Audacity did. is a good ed yes, free editing free. software. I, I bought Pro Tools right out of the gate. Don't oh. do that. Um, it's like using the space shuttle to start a campfire. Don't do that. Um, but uh, you know, you want to have some vague idea about the editing before you start auditioning, and then be very careful about choosing your first royalty share books. You don't want to go with just you know screen the books. Make sure you like it. Um, make sure it's actually you know a well-written book. There are even scams on ACX. There's scams everywhere. We're humans. That's what we do. So, uh, but you can learn all about that in the Facebook group and ACX. There's tons of resources, and I think we're generally a friendly bunch, aren't we? Would you guys? I know there's some other narrators over here. So, yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, you guys are amazing. This creature. Yes. I am. I wanted to ask about uh, sound effects. Do they do they replace the narration sometimes? Like, does narration become stage direction with like instead of saying there was a loud bang, do you just have a loud bang? I know the books I've done, sound effects are strictly frowned upon. Yeah, I've never done a book. Yeah. I've never had a book I wrote or performed a book or a story with sound effects. Mm -hmm. So, sorry. But I have listened to some of them. I just, uh, they might be written like a script, in which case it would say, enter, insert loud bang here. But if it's written in the text, then chances are the narrator would read the text. And a loud bang woke him up. It's usually a publisher decision because as a narrator, you are, you, even if you want all the he saids and she saids, even if you're putting on a voice, it's obvious. If it says she said, I'm going to say she said. Except I know um, Pseudopod and, and all those short story online, you know, they do audio. Yeah, and they will, if you submit a story to them, they even in their guidelines, they, they used to at least say, we're going to strip out all those things and just use the voices. So know that's going to happen. They're, they're starting to make some audio originals. Uh, I'm thinking of Anderson did one for an audio publisher. And I, I think you, you write those differently without the he said, she said, uh -huh. and all that stuff. You just take all that stuff out. Yes. Okay, next question. Go ahead. Um, when you said earlier about um, sometimes teams work together uh, for one book, do you think that will become more popular as time goes on? If you buy them, people will make more of them. If you listen, they will come. They're hard to do, and they're very expensive. Bruce Kogel did full cast audio for a long time, and he would actually just invite all the, all the voice actors to his house. So they could all be in the same place, on the same system, at the same time, in the same room noise. I mean, when you try to record someone who lives in Atlanta and someone who lives in Florida and someone who lives in New York, you've got to have a massive editor that knows how to put all those together and have the same level and have the same. It's hard when people are in different places and reacting to each other and they're not in the same room. So if you do multiple voices, the cost of the audiobook skyrockets. Especially if it's a series. So like the Wheel of Time, having Keith Redding and Michael Kramer committed to the entire 14 books. You know, you can't just change the writing out and set them books in. It will freak out. I mean, it happened with uh, Beast for Crows. They had to reproduce the whole book because uh, they, they had uh, John Lee and to, uh, to do that. And then um, I think one of the um, one of the Dresden books had John Glover's story. Poor John got ripped, of course, on Twitter. 
was pretty successful. But uh, and so they ended up having to reproduce that as well. So so knowing that, that, it, that uh, readers or listeners rather get get attached to the to the characters and their voices, uh, it, that you just multiply that risk for the producer. Mm -hmm. So I'm also gonna say on this one. Um, so I think it, so you know people here have been talking about the uh, cost component of that, but something that also needs to be thought of, um, especially like as an author, you know. Um, so is a time component because I want my book out as soon as possible. Because every time that, uh, so every day that an audiobook is not out is a day it's getting further away from the publication of my novel, which is making it less relevant to my readership. So if I have to wait months and months for a single audiobook, I, I put out a book every two months, or I try to, and that means if I'm waiting six months for a publication, and sometimes it's not even enough for a full cast, um, that means I've lost potentially thousands of people that will not come back and read it because they're not interested in it. Um, also, high, like the high rankings of your book will help to sell your audiobooks. So if your rank is still high and the audiobook is coming out, there's going to be a lot of people that are seeing that high-ranked audiobook because it is linked to your book on Amazon or wherever it is that you're selling. So um, in, my, in my opinion, it's a very cool concept, but it, um, for the narrator and the publisher, again, time is money. So if you're putting out a book, and we have uh, my, my narrator right now, he is doing, when he gets one of my books, he has it finished and back to uh, the uh, sound engineer. And so he's making lots and lots and lots of money. So, so that's like a really great uh, point. Uh, so I mentioned earlier about the, the percentage, my percentages are flipped, so most of my revenue actually comes from the audiobook. So I screwed up, which is part of why I'm here, so here's all the things I do wrong, don't do those. Uh, in my, my last book, uh, the print preceded the audiobook by six months. Uh, because of scheduling challenges and just a nightmare series of things. So um, if it's, that's not great, but it's okay if 80% of your revenue comes from your print book, it's not okay if 70% of it comes from your audiobook. So with my uh, my next book, the print book is done, it's with beta, it's gonna come back, I'm gonna do edits, um, and the, they're going to be, it's gonna be a simultaneous release. So all of my books, my, my personal decisions, all of my books come out simultaneously. Uh, some, some of the readers, the, the paperback readers, or the, or the hardcover readers, they're not as happy, uh, but it's a smaller it's a smaller subset, and if I have to upset somebody, um, it's the audiobook people that are just more and more uh, Okay, oh, that's right. I'm like, I'm just listening to the panel. It's great. Behind the pillar there in the blue shirt. Go ahead. Um, this is more for the writers. Do you tend to have to write differently? You have to write differently. You have to never write differently. I don't. I, I mean, I, to me, uh, audio is about 40% of my income. Um, but I'm, I, ultimately, I'm paid to write stories, and the stories that are making me money are the ones that I write. I, mean, I, I can't, I suppose, I, if I was doing, not that you're going to write a different story, but you older at all. No, no, I don't, I don't sit there, no, I don't sit there, I mean, like, no, I, I don't know. Nor do I write like going, if this is on the screen, it would be better to do this. I, I write it to be a, a story that I'm telling, either through a book or through an e-book or through audio. The same story. So for me, what I, what I do with my books is I, I intentionally write for multimedia. So um, when, I, when I was first getting started writing, uh, you know, we did a lot of research not only on you know, how to sell books, but also on how to write books. And, and something that I found was that a huge population of readership has dyslexia, right? And so then, um, so I started writing toward a dyslexia market. I made shorter paragraphs. I made, you know, uh, certain everything looked very consistent. So if they lost the place, they could find it. When audiobooks, uh, when I found out that audiobooks were so popular, I started writing for the audiobook market, right? So um, I took out all of my he said, she said, and I, I put in action sequences because otherwise it's like, hello, hello back, yes, hello to you, you know, and so, you know, it's like, hey, um, this, this room looks dangerous, 
he said, Port, this, this room looks dangerous. He looked around watching as kni uh, knives were grasped firmly with a hand. You know, some, you know, something like that where it is more show instead of talent. Yeah, I got just good writing. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm seriously, I'm saying it's a joke, but I'm serious. It's not very. In your brain, I understand that you did that for an audio, but really, as you're saying, yeah, that's just like I would have taught any writer that in a class I would have said, show them, show them, yeah, do this instead of that. So. But it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very common traditionally published thing, and it's also very, it's very um, standard thing. Of, sorry, I've been talking for three days. But my voice is going out. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a common thing though. If you if you look back, especially in books that are like very traditionally published. Um, you'll see a lot of he said, she said, and you get one exclamation point per book if you're lucky. <laughs> right. um, you get, you know, all of this stuff. And so you're, they, they do say show, don't tell, but they don't practice it. And so like when, when you're doing this, when you're, when you're learning how to write, people keep saying show, don't tell, but they don't give good examples. Yeah, they don't tell what that means. Right. They just say show, don't tell. Make, oh, yeah, show, don't tell. I've seen several times in narrator groups. Our biggest plea, I think, and you guys help me out on this, new writers, please read your work out loud to yourself. <laughs> because I've, I've narrated several first-time books, and they're excellent books, it's not that, but you will find that you have certain pet phrases, and it might have been a brilliant phrase the first time you used it, but if you use it 75 times in one chapter, I'm showing up at your house. <laughs> um, cerulean, it's a lovely word for blue, but don't use it 14 times in your book. Uh, and I think you don't catch that necessarily if you don't read it out loud to yourself or realize how much it's going to beat the person's ear in. Because that's the thing with audio. Page. You have to listen to every single word. Yes. You read, you skim. But that that is very important. Very important. So just to that, I would say that Scrivener is your friend. If you ever heard of the piece of software, uh, it's made my writing so much better. There's all sorts of tools that you can use to keep track of that. But to your specific question, um, so I, my writing kind of does change significantly. Um, because of the relationship with my my narrator, so I start to after the second book, I start to hear him in my head, which is odd. But uh, <laughs> so as I'm writing, I hear I hear him, and I know how he performs certain phrases and where his his inflections will be, and it actually changes some of the dialogue, not not the non-dialogue, but the dialogue. Well, actually, I might even shorten sentences because I know we'll, where he'll, we'll, he'll, how he'll pitch it. Uh, and it's really, I was never expecting it, and it's very interesting thing. So, so, and this is something you probably don't get to do unless you're working with, with really closely with the narrator. But I think it's a tremendous thing for, for that kind of partnership because you can, you can really start to have this synergistic relationship between them where, they, where their, their performance alters your writing and your writing also their performance. And, and getting the characters' voices in your head, because then you don't need that he said, she said, Tom said, Jane said, because they each have a different voice, and it should be a little bit more obvious who's saying what, who's doing what, yeah. so you can, you can cut those out that way. That's very true. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, you're talking about reading your work out loud. I, I have a little technique I use where I have a, a PDF viewer on my phone, and so what I'll do is I'll take whatever I'm working on, file it to PDF, and then I'll do a sluggage for it, but I'll use a computer voice to read it. And so I'll be driving somewhere and I'll just be listening to this, and then it's crap, crap voice, right? So now, but my question is, it's not going to be crap forever, it's going to get better. Oh, I thought you meant the computer voice was crap. That's your writing. I'm sorry. He is talking about the computer voice. You know, crap in, crap out. But, um, no, the, the voice, you know, you can swap out voices now. Yeah, and I think you're going to be able to do this with computer narration. So I don't want to be a downer to the whole panel, but you're wondering if this industry is going to die in the bud here because the computer narration is not too good. So here's a quick answer to that. At least at this point in time, while the, the, the quality of the voice is going to keep getting better they're not at a point where they're going to at least not right now where they can interpret where they can create the emotion and and and, and change the pacing of your speech based on the pacing of the scene things like that it's not quite it's, we still got some yeah. <laughs> i agree i think that, i think that's that's maybe one step behind not the accuracy 
Right. You can make the same argument now, even now that you see uh, you know, deep fakes and things like that, where you can use AI to, to create those types of things. But, but I, I think that, that, um, that that's one of those future states that you can worry yourself to death about it, and, and like, there's really nothing you can, you can do about it. I, I think that humans will probably always have a, a, a place in the arts, because that's just my, my... I think there's a level, I mean, you, you maybe see it a little more in live performance than you do in audio, but I'm not sure where you can hear and sense the feeling. I mean, when I'm narrating the scene where the Viking is holding his son as he dies and he's trying not to show how grieved he is because A, he's a Viking and he's a man and you know, I'm not gonna show my son that he's dying. There's an, a level of emotion that I'm feeling even if I'm holding it out of my voice, because again, he's a Viking, he's not gonna just sob like a girl. I feel like that communicates through the audio and you're gonna feel what I was feeling when you listen to that. I don't think a computer voice is ever going to come close to that. So I, th I think we're good for now. <laughs> Job secure. Yeah, so um, going off of the creating emotion, um, how often is it, there have been a couple of times where I've picked up an audio book and been like, oh, I can't do this narrator, it's really not doing it for me. But like, Dakota, I would not have listened to your book had I not come across, like, I came to your book because of your narrator. I had listened to another book, and I was like, okay, well, I've run out of that series, so let's see what else this specific, specific narrator has done, because he does a little bit job of emotion and reading the book. Um, so, when you guys are looking for narrators, have you ever run into narrators that didn't do a good job? Where you were just like, oh, I might need somebody new. Well, I promise you, I, I will say that when, when we are looking for narrators, what we do, you know, we is you look for people with the following. You know, we say, hey, you know, like, oh, hey, uh, Luke Daniels is, is reading my book. Um, and so we're like, oh my god, I love Luke Daniels, who are you? And I'm like, oh yeah, that's great. Good enough, you know, come on in. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's exactly why a, a good chunk of time why we pick the narrators that we do. Um, so there, there's something to be said with working with a new narrator and getting them, like, working with them with your books and with your company and moving up with them. Um, but also, there's something great about having a pre-built in market. So, hard to say. Go ahead. Not because of bad reviews, but I've had issues with things that happen. Scheduling conflicts, or um, there's all kinds of weird things. I, I had one lady who I was just trying to be really nice. And she kept no, she kept missing her deadline over and over, and I was not in any particular rush on this one series, I, and I just didn't want her to do the work myself. And eventually, and she threw a lot of work into it, and I finally gave her a, a, like the seventh hard deadline. But I'm like, this is it. If you don't, I literally, I don't care if it's one minute late. I'm not. We're done. And she missed that one by, you know. And I was like, that was it. So I ended up doing it all myself anyway. But was it the first book in the series? Yeah, thankfully. <laughs> because having to do it mid-series is, is awful. Yeah, in the back there. Um, okay, so kind of going off that last question about famous narrators. Um, I have one book that I've written that I'd love to narrate myself. By the time failing that, I'm also going to room to narrate. So, facing that. How do you get somebody famous like Will Wheaton or Michael Kramer or Ray Porter? Well, famous people get uh, enough words. <laughs> you roll a natural 20. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So with yeah. Will Wheaton, he has a two-year backlog, and he charges him flat twenty-five thousand dollars. Thank you. It's yeah. I mean, you're just it's it's so expensive. Even even just not famous, but there are very good audio uh, narrators, but they're if they're charging one or two thousand dollars per finished hour, you know, you don't want you're gonna be dropping six to ten thousand dollars and if it's your first book, you I'm sure you're a nice guy, but unless you unless you really roll you know, the perfect uh, and you're perfectly lucky you roll the perfect twenty, you're not gonna make that much money back on your first book right away. It's gonna take a long time. 
So, um, I will also say, so for you as a author, oh, yes. So, unless you already have the studio, the equipment, all that fun stuff that you need in order to narrate your own book, um, the one way that you're really generating money, one, the one thing that you're doing that's making you money is writing a book. So, you know, that, that's something that we all fall into a trap of is I want to do everything because I can't do everything. But, you know, if, if you're putting up book one, book two, book three, you're, get, you're building a fan base, you're making money off of that, you're eventually able to um, either entice someone to create your audiobooks for you or hire someone on that you want to narrate your books, right? So whether you work with someone else or whether you hire them directly. Um, so something is it's called the survival track. You can look it up on Google. Is um, finding the thing that makes you money and sticking to that and delegating those other tasks that you are that is not worth actually your time, even if you feel that they are. So just advice. Um, so I have to disagree a little bit with you So not all of us can do everything. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. Is that, is that, uh, I, I do alpha reads, uh, and, and my alpha readers have said that my narration is so horrible as to make my writing almost unreadable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, so, um, so I will never be a narrator. <laughs> so if you think you're close enough to be a narrator, just don't. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I, 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 You've got, you know, I've got five books in a series that are selling this amount, or, you know, they're on this list or whatever. Okay, you and then we'll do this one. Uh, I'm curious if any of you know whether the difference between an audiobook list price and the value of an audible credit hurts the author. <laughs> Does it hurt the author? Is that a question? Yeah. No, first of all, happy to take your money any way you want to give it to anyway. us. <laughs> Buy audiobooks. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, actually, I, I, I have to look it up right this second. Is, is, is it you make more off the credit or less? I forget. Uh, so it's it's a uh, percentage. So it's all it's all percentage. right. It's all, but there's a percentage. The percent. Uh, credits are typically considered to be worth fifteen dollars, but um, you will never see the full like the author will never see the full price. <laughs> For all of them, it just doesn't happen. Um, I think if you uh, if you if you are uh, exclusive with Audible, you're making forty. Uh, so the, the author is making forty percent. So Audible holds on to sixty percent. So it's it's very hard to wring information out of Audible. They are like to hide the details of what they do. So saying like a credit or something, a direct purchase is more. I I can even tell you, even if even if a credit is worth fifteen dollars. The full price is 24. It could be that they're saying the credit is today worth the full price, and they just don't tell us. Plus, so we, get, so we get paid if you buy with a credit, or if you just go on and buy straight. But there's also people who have a credit but choose not to use it. That's a different price that we get. So it, it's it's a mess, and 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 I don't remember it exactly because I learned that it's better for me to just I I, I figured it out at one point, just averaged it all together, and I know on average, regardless of what the actual price point is per book, on average they're all going to work out to be this amount of money, roughly, and that's how I can calculate it. Otherwise, I'd be well, better at finding the recipe for Coca Cola. <laughs> What, what happens is if you have a shorter book, you might get passed over because that one credit is the same. If your book is six hours and somebody else's book is 30 hours, it's one credit. They're going to get more bang for their buck for that 30 hour book. That's true too. Well, so this is an important thing though. We don't we don't control the price. Right. Right. Uh, right. We, we, can, we can't discount or right. any of that stuff. And the price is just handle. based on the length of the, the how many hours it is. Now there is yeah. a there is a bounty system which they just changed. And if if uh, if the person trying to get this straight, if a person is not an audible member and they become an audible member and their first credit is your book, you get 100 bucks. Yeah. If they stick around for a while. Now it's by the link. Now, yeah. 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 
Yeah, so it's Jeff Bezos, you know. And you then know. on the narrator side, it's the split out the same kind of way, but then it's different based on whether or not we have done. Well, it's usually that if you do the royalty share, it's based on right. they break it out, and then you said the royalty share plus is totally. Okay. Yeah. One thing I want to how many how many are authors in here that haven't done their first audiobook yet? People that are being interested in that. Okay, this one's for you, um, because you have the royalty share, which is where you don't pay the author, the uh, narrator anything up front when they finish the book. They're just getting a share of your profits. Then you have the per finished hour, where they're going to set a price, and this is how much I'm charging you now. If we do PFH, once we finish the book, can you pay us? We're out of the picture. All your profits belong to you. But Audible recently introduced Royalty Share Plus. It's rather badly named, in my opinion. But basically, what it is, it's a hybrid contract. I love them because we can accept a lower PFH to start with, say $100 or whatever works for that author. I'm not speaking for anyone. But so you pay a smaller amount to get that better narrator, but they still get profit sharing on the back end. So if you're looking to hire your first narrator and you know maybe you don't want to, because royalty share, a lot of times you're gonna get the newbies. That's where I started. I think that's where everybody starts, is royalty share because you just don't feel like you can command that price up front. When you want to get to that mid-level where we're not superstars yet, so we're not going to charge $1,000 PFH, but we would like some money, please. Um, so you're going to get a better pool of narrators to, char to choose from when you're offering that royalty share plus contract. Just one thing, absolutely do not ever say that you're going to do royalty share plus and then say, actually, I'd rather just do royalty share because narrators are getting really worked up about that. So I didn't realize that was a possibility. Yes, sir. Um, I write non-fiction. Some of the passages in the book were quite emotional because they deal with my personal experience. Um, how would you deal with that? Would you, or is it a bad idea to have the author himself speak these passages in addition to what the narrator does for the rest of the book? Absolutely. Um, I've done a couple of non-fiction. It didn't have... Can you repeat the question? Oh, the, the question was if you're doing non-fiction, which of course typically would be calmer, you wouldn't have the same level of voice acting, but he has personal passages in it that are fraught with emotion. What would be the best way? Would you want to bring the author in? Would it be okay to bring the author in to say his own pieces there, or how would you handle that? Um, the nonfiction I did didn't have that. It did have, because it was set up, they were written by a marriage counselor. So he wrote dialogues from marriage counseling. Fictional, of course, he did not violate any confidentiality. <laughs> so there was emotion in those passages. I think you could either have your narrator basically act as you and give them guidance for that, or absolutely, you could voice them yourself, it's just gonna get tricky with the editing, because you would need access to a good quality microphone, and your narrator or the person editing the book would have to have the skills to work that in. The easiest thing would be to just get a narrator that could approximate what you were feeling in those passages. So what you're saying is the narrator and the uh, author might be in two different cities, for example. Or even countries, yes. Countries, and it would be a little awkward. Absolutely. Well, just it's complicated and expensive, because that's the question we brought up before with the multi, multi-voice tracks it just gets really expensive and everyone has to be on the same page and literal little page right the <laughs> sorry about that unintentional i guess maybe the, the best thing to do in that case would be just to supply the uh the reader the narrator with my voice expressing this passage and let him take the ball from there how's that yeah that that, that would work yeah. Okay, more questions. Come on, you guys are also there. You go. So there's been a lot of talk about uh, you know, per hour rates and you know, budget for the next bottom line without asking people to get into their own company. What is the budget for an upcoming future? We have a group of people that want to put some things together. We have sound effects for the cabinet, absolutely more or whatever. You can get to say it's cost prohibited. What is the budget for how to I have never seen that outside of royalty ship. So half out of the so for everything. I think it, it varies from all the wrong because when you're when you're when you're looking to hire somebody to do your audio book, part of what you have to budget in is you have to look at what you can realistically make 
when you, you know, if, if, and this is actually for narrators as well, but if, when uh, she was talking about uh, uh, being careful about who you royalty share with, one of the things you should check is how well is that book selling? Because if it's, so if, it's, if that author's rank is in the millions, you know, which is very, very, very low, you're, yeah, you're a royalty share, but that means they're selling one book every six months, maybe. Which generally means about two dollars. Yeah, because you're not going to get anything. You know, if they're if they're ranking, you know, up in uh, you know five thousand or, or number one, then you know, then you're going to actually make your coup. So that's kind of what you uh, on either side of the equation. If you're the author, how you can spend ten thousand dollars and get a great great uh, audio book, and if you can make that back in a reasonable amount of time, great, do it, if it makes you happy. But you've got to decide what a reasonable amount of time is, too. Are you looking at it from an author perspective or a narrative? Uh, actually, from an audio engineering, you can see if you're So, okay. if you're going to offer that to people that are going to put that together, what, what, what would a package look like? Like, like, like? So often that's to work with the narrator or put it on? Yeah, you're going to say, hey, you've got a cast. Yeah, it makes it sound like for you. So that's that's tough because you know as as the person putting that together, so as the engineer, right, or as the producer, you have to look at paying all of those employees that are going to be doing all of that. You know, are are they are they bringing in music? Are they, how many hours are they there a week? You know, like what? How long is this project going to take? So it, it's at that point, especially starting out, it's how am I going to pay my people to come in and actually do this if it's not for finished hour? And then if it is for finished hour, it's got to be a pretty high rate because that's I mean you're paying five, four, five, six people. You're paying possibly fifty people playing instruments. Um, you might be bringing together custom music, even, like depending on depending on the services that you offer. So that per finished hour is going to look really high, and it's something that you know the audience may or may not want. It depends on the genre. I said not. I understand your question better now. I would say, as an author, I would tell authors out here if you're looking to just hire somebody, the whole process. At most, I mean, on the high end, uh, for you know, not a big name author or anything, probably two thousand dollars. And on the low end, you might be able to get away with depending on the length of your book, six hundred bucks. So it's a wide range, and it just depends. You know, that's the, anything above two thousand for just production or for the tablets. This is just to have, have a finished audio of, of just a regular one person narrative, not a whole production, you know, just a regular narrative. I mean. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's, a large, it's, a, it's a large scope, but, uh, but I'm, I'm talking about, you know, again, this, this is not uh, uh, mid, not even mid-list level writer, writing or anything, just kind of beginning writers, working with beginning writers, you know, you're only about 100, or 100 bucks for a finished hour, and your book is so for, for me, and mine is my green, so I just use 300 or 500 to finish hour, inclusive of, um, of uh, that's inclusive of, of, of production, uh, mastering, that's finished product, ready to go, um, perfectly leveled MP3s that are going to go and pass audibles to the people. Yeah. But then, see, and again, you have to look at each author because you've already establish that you you're making a lot more money off audiobooks so you have a larger threshold than somebody who does. Right. So it's, so it depends. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, as much as I would love to continue this panel forever, we're actually out of time. So thank you so much to our panelists and thank you that's doing an audiobook panel, uh, I would love